Okay, brilliant. Well, I'll get started then because there's a, a bit to um, get through. Basically, the presentation will be a rough introduction to the background, how the system works up here, um, and then, as Jenny just said, the key, the key messages for um, calves, beef, um, suckler cows, dairy cows, an overview of everything, and look forward to the discussion at the end. So, um, basically, the background is, as most of you probably know, um, uh, um, the review uh, back in 2013-14, which the result of which was closure of all but six of the VI centres, and the worry at the time and still that you know reduced access to postmortems, all that sort of thing. So we thought we'd better have a look and see uh, what else could be done, and was it feasible to offer a postmortem service via a um, fallen stock collection centre, and see would there be much uptake, and what useful information can we find? So that's what we did. We identified the Knackers Yard near me, which is the one I work in. The fact that it's done at the Knackers Yard obviously means there's no need to travel and deliver the carcasses. Um, you can stack them higher and sell them cheaper. And the aim was for a quick turnaround time to um, report back to farmers and their vets, um, you know, as quickly as possible with the, with the findings of a gross uh, post-mortem. So this was the post-mortem that we've built. Um, it's basically as much as you need, not much more, not much less. Um, two tables, a drain, a hoist, a winch, hot water, um, cold water, cupboards, and that's the sink. And then through there is where the, the, um, the lab is. Um, that's where it all happens. The cost of the farmer that we decided on the beginning of the project was, uh, as you can see, £20 for a lamb, £25 for a ewe, £30 for a calf, £50 for a beast, and £70 for a cow or a stock ball. That doesn't include the collection, and it doesn't include any further testing apart from the one uh, that I did myself. So that was the rate at which we uh, set it. Uh, this is how it would work. Briefly, the um, farmer would request a post-mortem when he requests collection of the carcass. The office would then tell me and send me this form. I would then get in touch with the farmer, um, find out who his vet was, find out the clinical history, let the vet know if he did already that the post-mortem was being done. Um, then when or on other occasions the vet would phone me first of all then and I would get that um, report and I wouldn't need to phone the farmer to get the history because I'd already have it. Um, anyway, once this was done and it was established that I was going to post more than this creature as it says in the bottom left hand corner there, then when the guy goes to collect it on the farm he puts on a specific um, leg tag with a unique number identifier and when he gets back writes it on this board in the post-mortem room, the one, two, three, four, road uh, from the left is the tag number, he comes and writes it on, and I've already written the farmer's name and the details I'm on the left, and then I can just read the tag, find out whose it is, do the post-mortem. Once I've done the post-mortem, I generate this report, which is uh, one page. This is the old one because the Eblex logo uh, is different now, but um, it aims to be one page, aims to have a one sentence um, headline diagnosis with a brief clinical history, uh, producer vet, the submission details of the, of the animal, brief clinical history, brief post-mortem findings to justify my diagnosis in there, two photos, comment, and that's what's sent to you by email or post, um, usually within 24 hours of the post-mortem having been finished. Um, so that's how the system works briefly. Um, the results, this is the, the project as was, uh, between, 2004, uh, between April 2014 and May 2015, here are the numbers. As you can see, um, aim was to do 300 of each, and we nearly did. More lab, we did more lambs, as you can see. The, the second column from the right is the one you're looking at. Um, 264 lamb submissions, 290 ewe submissions, and then um, the numbers, as you can see them, as we go down. And since then, the numbers will be uh, as high as them um, or higher. The project has carried on, and the diagnostic service remains at the same um, post-mortem service kept on doing it there, basically. So those, those were the numbers. Um, and I thought I would just go through the key messages for each um, class of stock uh, and what we found on those uh, um, 243 calves, 129 beasts, and 112 cattle. Um, that, that was just like the cows, by the way, adult cattle. There's also another 100 and odd um, dairy cows to go onto that, onto that data. And the, the discussion also goes on to include some of the um, submissions that have been submitted since then, i.e. between um, April 2014 
2015 and now. Um, so for CARBs, here's the summary, the frequency diagram of all the diagnoses that were made in CARBs. The top one is suckler CARBs, and just in the local demographic here, the majority of CARBs that came in were suckler CARBs. The bottom one is um, rearing CARBs. Um, so we're basically going to, mainly going to concentrate on the suckler CARBs in this one. And as you can see, the, the diagnosis further to the left is pneumonia. Uh, so that's the first one to talk about. Um, Here's the seasonal diagnosis of pneumonia, and as you would expect, um, there's, a, there's a, um, a peak in the, um, November to May during the house period. That's when we see most pneumonia, as you'd obviously expect, um, are usually in autumn-born, um, autumn stroke, winter-born uh, suckler calves. Um, they, weren't, they weren't generally vaccinated, but um, that's just the nature of the um, calves um, around here. Um, and here is my attempt to characterize. I thought it would be worth going over the um, types of pneumonia that were found in the project um, in such the cars. Um, um, the strong red lines are histologically confirmed primary bacterial pneumonia. So um, in total, there were, for example, primary bacterial pneumonia. In total, there were 14 diagnoses. Um, of them, um, four were histologically confirmed, and the rest um, were made on growth post-mortem alone because the farmer didn't want to pay the money to um, confirm. Uh, next one is previous viral, um, and you can read that for yourself. Those are the, the distribution of the, di of the diagnoses as was. The primary bacterial pneumonia, or suspect primary bacterial pneumonia, was the first, was the commonest uh, diagnosis. And it's an interesting question. What's the most cost-effective way to undertake further testing in cases of respiratory disease in the absence of being able to uh, commission any test uh, under the sun uh, and you know, having to pay for them all and because often end stage lungs and by the time they die can all, can all look the same because you have an initial insult, an opportunistic bacterial infection, it's difficult to know uh, where to start and we'll come to that uh, later. So here's the typical appearance of a primary bacterial, histologically confirmed primary bacterial bronchial pneumonia which is the commonest cause of um, pneumonia in suckler calves that are found. Um, here's another picture, primary bacterial pneumonia. You can see the um, uh, stiff, consolidated lungs, if you could feel it, the marked interlobular edema, um, and the multifocal uh, base lesions within those lungs. Uh, the same there. And there's some, um, on the left-hand side there, you have some hemorrhage and some um, probably trigosid necrosis. Uh, that's it. And there's the uh, marbling effect of the gross um, bacterial pneumonia. Just remember, I've got a mouse here. Um, if, if lungs would classify those as uh, primary bacterial pneumonia, the commonest cause, um, uh, sometimes histologically confirmed, sometimes not. Um, and here is the second type of bacterial pneumonia in these suckler calves um, a viral insult um, damages the airways, interferes with the mucus theory escalator causes an opportunistic bacterial pneumonia to land further down the lungs and um, uh, re uh, re um, replicate down there, causing more extensive pneumonia. Um, next one in the list, and this was more seen in um, rearing calves than as a primary disease problem in suckler calves, is RSV. And there you can see the air bully um, and air sort of trapped in the um, chordodorsal lung fields able to get in but not able to get out. Uh, that's a close up version of the same thing. That's, a, that's a, another picture of a confirmed RSV bronchial pneumonia. Uh, again, that's an air bullet characteristic of um, RSV. Um, RSV basically, as most of you know, um, it's pretty ubiquitous, often seen after a cold snap. The most important thing being that vaccines are very effective and yet it's still seen as a clinical entity. Um, causing pneumonia and losses uh, in calves. Um, the next one, if we go back to the um, this diagnosis, this third one along here is pleural pneumonia. It was seen with surprising uh, frequency. Um, I usually ascribe this is where you open up the lungs and there's some um, pleurisy. Usually ascribe that to a sublethal bout of uh, Mannheimia hemolytica or other um, septicemic. Uh, disease, but it's surprisingly common uh, in suckler cells. The other differential would be sarnalosis, and that was always ruled out um, by uh, bacterial cultures 
uh, where appropriate, and there's the same thing, but um, more chronic lesions. Um, the next one we saw was uh, mycoplasma bovis, not so much in uh, suckling calves, more in the rearing calves, and that's the typical uh, casio necrotic um, uh, nodules in um, mycoplasma bovis. Um, the last one was these guys here. Uh, so that's, that's the end of the, the um, house period. But these guys here, these uh, pneumonia seen in suckler calves out of grass uh, in May, June, and July isn't a time you would normally expect to see these primary bacterial uh, lesions in these calves out of grass, um, which made me think of um, an underlying cause. And this is a particular uh, feature of suckler calves, which are always probably or, or at risk of sometimes flirting with uh, mineral deficiency. Um, and I think this is what happens. And, and um, in most of those cases, you see primary bacterial pneumonia, which you're pretty sure that that's what it is, and it's unusual. So you, rather than uh, characterize the pneumonia itself, go and check for the underlying cause, which in this case, copper stroke selenium deficiency. And I think this is what was happening. The calf in utero, um, depending on its dam for all its copper and selenium via the placenta, um, uh, was not getting it because the cow up here was being fed unsupplemented silage. So the calf was um, born rather depleted of um, selenium and copper where they, uh, there is when they're inside, turn them all out. The cow uh, will go outside, eat some more soil, eat some of these pure all mineral buckets. Um, so the cow is okay, can replenish its stores, but there's not very much copper and selenium in milk. So not much goes uh, via the milk to the calf, which then starts off low and gets lower and lower and lower as it uses up its reserves and ends up succumbing to a, an opportunistic bacterial infection, which it shouldn't really succumb to um, by being uh, deficient because it, it hasn't been able to uh, replenish its stores because of drinking a, a, a selenium and copper deficient um, substrate, i.e. milk. Um, so that's um, what was happening in those cases, which were a small, but I'd say significant um, contribution to the overall pneumonia in um, suckler calves at grass. Bearing in mind, to go back to the original um, slide, that a good, you know, around about 10% uh, of cases, sorry, 20% of calves overall, suckler calves, died of pneumonia, which is a, a rather sobering thought in terms of where the industry um, needs to, um, what, what it needs to worry about, uh, should we say. Um, and that was a rough breakdown of the pneumonia cases as diagnosed by this project. Um, the next um, key point for suckler calves was that these um, diagnoses in red here, cholecystemia, nasal or crypto, all those sorts of things, all influenced by perinatal management, i.e. Um, colostral adequacy and navel dipping. Uh, and the important point that we noticed was that calves didn't necessarily die during the perinatal period, but would often linger and die at older, three months, two, three, four months old, sometimes out at grass by then, of diseases which had had time to fulminate and develop um, in the meantime. So these lungs, for example, came from a three-month-old uh, suckler calf out at grass, which didn't look too bad, um, but had probably... Um, not had the best start in life, probably had a, uh, maybe didn't get its navel dipped or got an infection, maybe didn't have enough colostrum, because that infection is all of that time old, probably. And um, the, although the calf didn't die at the time, the problem is likely to have originated in the perinatal period. This is the same chronic lung abscessation, same history, uh, same age. Uh, here's a brain abscess from a calf, which was, uh, this is a rearing calf actually, found um, two, three months old, wide based stance. Uh, progressive ataxia and um, recumbency, uh, take the brain out, take the lid off, and there you can see the toothpaste-like um, pus, which has been probably brewing in that calf ever since it was uh, born. Uh, same thing again here. This is a classic um, um, navel ill, chronic navel ill. There's the, probably the navel um, um, portal there, and the navel ills come up infection has gone in. This is a liver uh, sat on the side. This is the inspissated pus within the liver. Um, and this is the pus uh, leaking out of where it's come in from. Um, 
the important thing being that the calf didn't die uh, at the uh, time it was deprived of colostrum or uh, didn't have its navel dipped. Uh, it waited three months later. It's difficult to make the association between dead calf in field and um, improvements that could have been made in the perinatal period. Um, here's a, um, this is actually a, a calf that was brought in at foot expensively of a um, suckler calf, and here we have a big abscess in its heart, which had just got bigger and bigger and bigger until one day couldn't, um, the heart just couldn't pump the blood around it, and it died with that. Here again, um, spinal abscess in the neck. Um, here's a normal spinal cord cut down the middle. Here's a spinal abscess, but progressive pressure on the spinal cord, uh, which this calf had neurological, uh, progressive neurological signs, uh, and eventually succumbed, probably again from something that it picked up in the perinatal period. Uh, chronic navel ill, again, this was a similar age. Um, you can see how old this is. A, just a, I've opened up the abdomen here, and you've got fibrin, 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 and gut stuck together, and sepsis um, just became overwhelming. And the calf eventually um, uh, uh, lost, the, the lost um, uh, uh, died. Um, again, started during the perinatal period. Um, this is something else that you'll see when you've had a chronic septicemia, bacteremia, is these multifocal lesions in the kidneys where you get blockage of endarterial uh, and uh, chronic, um, just a sign of uh, um, repeated, probably, bouts of bacteremia in calves. Um, so the take-home message is being pneumonia is, was um, a major cause of loss in calves in this study, and there was arguably a scope for better application of best practice, uh, ventilation, control of immunosuppressant uh, vaccination, um, all those sorts of things um, for pneumonia. Uh, also, the scope for improving the perinatal environment to avoid calf losses. Two pretty simple things, but two things which still cause uh, significant losses uh, in calves um, in the industry today. Um, so that was the calf. This is beef. Um, Basically, the, the, the short message with um, beef, this is mean anything, probably most things that are post-weaned, so sort of nine months to finish. Um, two major diseases, pneumonia again when housed, clostridial disease when out of grass, accounted for, as you can see, a vast majority of them, uh, as highlighted in red uh, on that graph. So we'll go through the causes of clostridial disease, the first being black leg, and important when it's black leg, to realize that the black areas of discoloration have to be within the muscle bellies, uh, not within the uh, inter, 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 uh, fascial tissues and not just under the skin. They have to be within the actual muscle bellies there. And the diagnosis is quickly made by making a, an impression smear of the affected or uh, sending them off for an FAT, fluorescent antibody test, the same data around test, and, and uh, detecting the presence of. Uh, Clostridium shovii novii septicum, and here we are. So that's a um, that'll be a, a thigh muscle there, cut out black, uh, dry sometimes, um, emphysematous, and this is a um, lesion in a masseter muscle um, of a, in a big outbreak of confirmed uh, Clostridium shovii. That's black leg here, black disease, commoner than I expected, but here's the classic lesion of black disease, typically obviously where there's been. Uh, fluke migration through the liver causing tracts. Here's the um, necrotic beige uh, region and a sort of halo of black um, around the outside and cross section of the liver. And also here in a different sort of lesion, both these were confirmed with FATs, is, a, is some black discoloration of the liver. And you can see this um, emphysema as the um, clostridia have been proliferating uh, from uh, spores. Black disease commoner than I um, had expected, and that's the classic lesion. Um, Clostridium perfringens epsilon intoxication gives you this classic um, uh, yellow uh, interlobular edema appearance of the lungs. Um, you have to take the brain out to confirm it histologically. Uh, it seems to be being recognized with increasing frequency as that recent um, uh, uh, paper in the vet record uh, shows and shouldn't be um, ignored in cattle. Uh, same thing as pulpy kidney in sheep. Those are the, ma the major um, clostridial diseases that we saw during this project. Um, uh, to take home message being that prevention should be um, cost effective, simple, and cheap with pretty effective uh, vaccines. Um, then again, 
moving on to the house period and the breakdown of the causes of pneumonia in these beasts, um, of which two I'll highlight. One, obviously, IBR, um, causing these severe necrotic lesions in the entire length of the trachea. Um, same thing here. Often you get a pretty severe um, abscessating uh, craniovental bronchopneumonia as well, uh, and sometimes pleuropneumonia too. And depending on the length of time the thing's been ailing for, quite marked deposition of uh, necrotic horrible stuff in the uh, um, um, trachea. Um, you, it's important to move this stuff away and make sure the trachea is ulcerated underneath because um, it, it can be, well, it, it, don't confuse it with mucopus coughed up from further down the lungs, um, which isn't caused by IBR. Uh, basically, a lot of the IBR, in fact, I think almost all of the IBR found was in bought in strong stores which hadn't been vaccinated on arrival up the nose. Vaccine is uh, very effective and pretty um, pretty uh, uh, cost effective for bought in strong stores. And I would think it's near essential for anybody doing that. Um, um, it, 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 which is basically uh, all you need to know, but it still causes uh, losses. Uh, then the other one, uh, the other common disease found in uh, bought in strong stores was shipping fever from these. Uh, cattle which were brought in from a mart, mixed, stressed, moved, um, changed the feed, all that sort of thing. Um, within about 10 days, the uh, resident populations of Mannheimia hemolytica and other opportunistic bacterial um, organisms living in the throat would find their way down into the um, lower lung fields, um, undergo the uh, logarithmic phase of reproduction and cause this uh, characteristic here. This is actually Mannheim. Um, we call it uh, it's not going to this one hemorrhagic lesions and this marked marbling effect here of the uh, fibrinous fibrinosuppurative um, pneumonia sometimes with a uh, pretty marked pleurisy as well and uh, you don't live very long once you've had that which you wouldn't want to anyway because uh, you'd only be a screw if you did survive um, so that's shipping fever difficult to cope with really only thing to suggest I suppose is to treat these animals when they arrive um, gently introduce them um, perhaps into a quarantine pen with just the mates they came with for a bit and um, uh, uh, try and minimize stress and uh, vaccinate them with whatever um, uh, viral vaccines, usually IBR, they need. Um, that's shipping fever. And the other, here's another little cautionary tale. This was a beast uh, which was just uh, found dead one day. Um, on post-mortem, you can see this um, bulging, this is the, um, I've cut into the heart here. This is a, uh, in endocardium. That's the myocardium there. I think this is the, I can't remember. Oops. Hang on. This is the, I think it was the left ventricle. Here's a bulgy bit. You can just make out this bulgy bit here. And um, when I cut into it, this is what it contained this horrible um, uh, uh, caseous pus. Um, I think the pus, this is um, myocardial abscessation. And the pathogenesis being that um, there is a cause of bacteremia somewhere, maybe a dirty needle, maybe a bad foot, maybe a bout of acidosis, something like that, which um, ends up in the bloodstream, uh, then is, uh, comes out the um, aorta during systole, back down diastole to supply the um, myocardium with its uh, blood supply, oxygen, all that sort of thing, where upon the uh, bacteria settle out in the myocardium, cause an abscess like that, which eventually uh, causes death either through rupture or by obstruction. So, and from my experience of these cases, sometimes the, um, the choice of needles to inject these things isn't the cleanest. And it's an, I'm not saying that is the cause, but it's a possible risk, and it's an easy thing to do to use a clean needle every time and throw away the dirty one. And uh, what a thing to lose um, at that stage. This thing was about to go on the wagon fat. Um, so, those are the key messages for beef, clostridial disease. Um, uh, preventable um, with uh, cheap vaccines um, and pneumonia together accounts for 42% of all diagnoses, pretty uh, significant, um, and minimize the risk of farmer induced disease by using clean needles, which is the easiest thing uh, you can do. Not the only risk, but the easiest one to solve, probably. Um, then uh, moving on to suckler cows and the first and the uh, sorry, the um, key messages that I thought we would um, highlight. Here's a um, summary of the frequency diagnoses of the various uh, diagnoses made. John's disease, I thought, was surprisingly high prevalent. Um, um, some of these cows admittedly were sent into uh, and were shot 
and submitted to confirm the diagnosis, but it, it, it was surprising the amount of disease that was out there and is out there, um, uh, especially given that the um, uh, disease in the suckler herd should be reasonably easy to um, make a start on at any rate. Um, so that, that was uh, quite surprising. Uh, the second thing I w wanted to mention was this uh, straw impaction, which we saw three times, um, which was a surprising amount. I mean, I, I suppose when you're trying to slim down sucker cows, it's okay to feed them straw, but not too much. Um, and there was people got um, caught out. Basically, this picture here, this is the rumen, um, and this is the... Oops. This is the rumen, this is the abomasum. You can see the abomasum is nearly as big as the rumen, and uh, it just got completely impacted. The rumen bugs just haven't been able to, or haven't had enough energy and protein in the rumen to break down the straw, and it's just got impacted and impacted and impacted. Um, and in this case, it's actually ruptured and caused peritonitis there as the uh, impacted um, 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 abomasum ruptured. So there for the um, industry, uh, Advice is, to, you know, perhaps some advice on how and when and how appropriately to feed cow straw, and and when to when to slim them down for best effect. And a, a rule of thumb is that they shouldn't be given more than 1.5% of their own body weight in straw uh, to avoid problems, and should have uh, sufficient rumen degradable protein and fermentable metabolizable energy to help them um, digest it. Um, that was surprising. Fog fever is another. This this whole project, I should say, was really. Um, devised to benefit the industry and cases of fog fever occur every year and this is a, a, an example in cattle of a seasonal disease where seasonal disease warnings can help prevent losses i.e. they always happen in it always happens in October uh, well, September October November where uh, cattle are being moved off fogs and onto onto well, from bad bad pasture to better uh, which is the risk factor for fog fever because the uh, three methyl indole forms in the rumen and uh, causes a, uh, damage to the lungs. And so seasonal disease warnings, be aware of fog fever, don't let cattle get too hungry. And if you think they might be, then supplement them. That sort of thing is the sort of thing that could benefit the whole industry and prevent losses before they occur. Um, so yeah, significant numbers of fog fever, same last year, same this year. The interesting thing I, uh, uh, I should mention, by the way, is that you'll notice the absence of staggers in that list. That just so happened that it didn't have any staggers last year. Oh no, one case, sorry, one case. In contrast to this year, where I've had quite a few, and I think that's possibly just the year that it was uh, last year. But all sorts of biases and confounders could also explain it. Um, the other thing to mention is that post-carving catastrophes, I put here peritonitis obstetrical, uh, um, are, do make a significant uh, contribution to mortality in um, suckler cows, and the thing to notice or remember or observe is that it isn't necessarily um, immediately after carving. Sometimes these things linger for a surprisingly long time and, and can have this um, peritonitis all in here and even ruptured bladders and even then can leak um, for quite a while after carving. You know, you're talking a month, six weeks, something like that before they finally uh, snuff it. Um, so post-carving catastrophe is one of those things, just an occupational hazard of being a suckler cow, I suppose. but. Um, I don't think it can't be just because it's been a while since carving. Um, and that's the key messages for suckler cows. For my money, John's disease was surprisingly prevalent. Um, Post-carving calamity can happen quite a while. And then fog fever and straw impaction, useful things uh, for a knowledge transfer and educational um, role, I think, for um, the industry. That's suckler cows. This is dairy cows. Um, here's the frequency table from for the dairy cows. Typically, um, the things you would expect, but I would just like to highlight the fact that these things, wire, uh, lung abscess, endocarditis, cordon vena cava thrombosis, liver abscess, accounted for a, a pretty high proportion, 38 of 105, and that, that trend will be roughly continued in the postmortems done since then, 36% of cases caused by them. Here are some pictures. Here is a cow hung upside down and the um, guts just starting to flop forward here. And here's the diaphragm just in here. Here's some adhesions between the reticulum here and the diaphragm, getting a handle on the fact that this, there's the wire penetrated through there. There's an abscess. There's an abscess in there. And here's the heart, typical bread and butter 
pericarditis, very common. And, um, 20, of the 20 cases, there were would be clusters on odd farms, but even if you count the number of farms, um, it's still the, the commonest diagnosis, which I found mildly surprising, possibly the increased use of uh, feeder wagons and tire, tire wires, that sort of thing, and there were times getting on. Here's a caudal vein vena cava thrombosis. Here's this is the case of uh, subacute ruminal acidosis. There's some adhesions. There's a the liver abscess just breaking out. And here is the um, caudal vena cava. You just take out the liver, lay it on its back, um, and you find the caudal vena cava that it runs through. Here's a normal caudal vena cava. Here's an um, abscessed caudal vena cava, and this abscess is just eaten into this caudal vena cava here. Um, cause death. The same thing has happened here. Normal, um, uh, uh, abnormal. Um, then from there you get um, uh, embolic spread and damage to uh, especially pulmonary arteries and massive epistaxis, which normally they die of. Uh, endocarditis is pretty common. Again, same pathogenesis. This is the uh, semilunar valve with a big uh, vegetative lesion there. Same thing here in a, another semilunar valve, uh, massive uh, endocarditis. And then same thing here in the mitral valve here, a uh, close-up of mitral valve there. Pulmonary abscessation also pretty common. Bacteremic spread settles out in the lungs. Um, and there we go. Uh, the pathogenesis is just the same. Focus of infection somewhere. Um, uh, then either because of a dirty needle, subacute renal acidosis, foot lesions, uh, and in the case of wires, um, feeder wagon and silage pit maintenance. Um, all these things are reasonably easy to do. The difficulty being that the time between the focus of infection starting and death due to either of any of those things can be uh, considerable, but so it may be difficult to ascribe cause to effect. But there are some easy things that can be done to reduce uh, the risk, which is why I'm wondering, is this the lowest hanging fruit uh, on dairy farms? And with these things being, with abscesses, wires being so common, um, are, is there more we could be doing uh, to prevent them and prevent mortality? That, I think, is the end. Oh, here's the link to the summary research project, which you can get later. Um, and now I think discussion. How are we doing for time, Jenny?